the most famous paintings of Yves Tanguy. In this video, we will see the most famous works of Tanguy. The French artist of the Surrealism movement, most famous in the entire history of art. Extinction of Useless Lights Artwork by Yves Tanguy, from the year 1927. Extinction of Useless Lights plunges us back into a surreal and dreamlike world. The main characters are dressed in undulating amoebas, and the steppe landscape is made up of stunted and languid plants, and a smoking chimney on the horizon line from which a hand comes out. Beneath it, a character leans on her right, while on her left a large white coral reigns over the deep sky. Further to the right a white falcon flies away from everything with a sphere between its claws. And everything is framed by a sky that could remind us of the night, the light tones of the horizon suggest that its darkening is due to pollution or contamination, that is why some greenish tones are intermingled in it. Although it is true that the composition shows a greater chromatic amplitude than other works by the author, the theme once again evokes Tongi's personal way of conceiving an empty space unconnected with everything, with eminent references to war. So much so that the diagonal line that is drawn from the cloud of smoke in the upper right corner to the hand on the chimney reminds us of a shot, an aerial blast. The life and personality of Eve is reflected in each of his works, and if we delve into the meaning and taking the title as a starting point, we could outline, practically without any risk, that this work alludes to the crudest side of war, to that permanent extinction of light that inherently leads to death. Multiplication of the Arcs Artwork by Yves Tanguy, from the year 1954 the dreamlike and unnatural worlds are a well-known letter of presentation for Tanguy, even so, the work that we have in hand today shows one of the most shocking variegations of his entire list of winners. All the inhuman objects, which are encapsulated up to the horizon line, proclaim to us a quite peculiar horror vacui, a saturation of space that submerges us in a great scrapyard of figures. The title suggests that these objects are presented as arches and have multiplied rapidly, and although we have already become accustomed to Tongi's poetic and suggestive hand when giving titles, we wonder, where are the arches? This is the effect that its maker seeks, to provoke in the viewer an endless search, a decoding of forms that seem to never end. Although we notice a more varied color palette than in other of his compositions, the effect of color in this work is used to confuse and disconcert the audience, color not having importance per se, but rather it is given in the surrealist project that permeates the composition. We could easily find a reference to war on the canvas. These arches will represent a force that multiplies for a purpose, war. The thick white three-dimensional objects, different from the arches, create a strange movement of depth, Paradoxically they are white shadows that move, while the large number of arches are the rhythm, the basis of a martial parade. We see that this work brings out the curiosity within people, plays with the role of the classic spectator, encouraging him to transcend his role as viewer to dress him up as a detective, and immersing him in a search for something that is not well known what it is, if it is or if it is. The questioning of reality, and the loss, within an interactive process, are the genius of multiplication of the arcs. Imaginary Numbers Artwork by Yves Tanguy, from the year 1954 The work belonged to the dealer Pierre Matisse, son of Henri Matisse himself, who in 1931 opened a gallery in New York, and from 1958, it was in the hands of the great historian of the modern movement and curator of the Museum of Modern Art, William Rubin, until he entered in the Tyson Bornemissa collection in 1973. During the final years of his life, Yves Tongi's painting becomes darker and less poetic. In imaginary numbers, for some his last work, the previous biomorphic forms become rocks and are no longer isolated to form compact sets of geological formations. These ambiguous monuments, which some authors relate to the sculptures of Henry Moore or Hans Arp, can be understood as a premonition of death. 
As in multiplication of the arches, a painting from the same year, the strange and inexorable sea of stones becomes a terrifying labyrinth in which any hope of escape disappears. Everything becomes inorganic, everything petrifies and becomes timeless in an exaggerated way. A labyrinth is drawn that takes place in an unreal marsh in which figures of different shapes successively converge. These figures are cylindrical and soft, and play in their superposition to intertwine with each other. The technique in which the author elaborates, by means of very fine undulating lines, that imaginary sea of deep waters, and that plateau in the background, flat and solitary upholstered with a zebra motif, is truly magnificent. The colors, as almost always, are very restricted, out of the shades of gray and black we only occasionally find blue in the figure that reminds us of a chameleon eye, and very faint rust red in certain shadings. The protrusions of the cliffs, as if they were fjords, evoke the author's native Brittany, its sculpted coasts, cut out in high walls of white rock. Death Awaiting His Family Artwork by Eve Tongi, from the year 1927 It is in 1927 when Eve Tongi begins his most mature and personal work. It is in this chronology, when he would exhibit his works at the Galerie Surrealist in Paris, a space endorsed by André Breton, adventure facilitated in part by his friendship with Jacques Prevert and by his newly acquired contacts in the Surrealist group. It is here that for the first time he exhibits this dreamlike landscape entitled Death Stalking His Family. The painting depicts a beach of blackened, dusty, steaming dunes. A structure with a circular plan, apparently a tower or an industrial chimney, gathers around it a group of biomorphic forms. On the left, a larger figure, conventionally presented as a decomposing body, approaches what appears to be a plume of rising smoke that recedes into the margin. In the center, a scribbled scene reminds us of the explosion of an airplane in the sky. The author, who for a time experimented with automatic drawings, combines in the composition the psychic automatism typical of the Surrealists, using a very diluted oil technique, and certain realistic reminiscences, shown in the treatment of the objects that appear in the canvas. The hallmark will lie in his eagerness to paint solitary landscapes close to abstraction, and arranged in an imaginary world codified in a restrictive range of greys. Specifically, we see how the floating forms are undeniably related to the influence of Miro in the central years of the 1920s, while the spatial organization of the seascape evokes de Chirico's metaphysical style. It is a work that tells us in a very clear way about the author's past, about his homeland, about his father, the deceased Navy captain, and about Tongi's most characteristic psychology, emptiness and loneliness framed in a desolate wasteland. Mama, Papa is Wounded Artwork by Eve Tongi, from the year 1927 Again, Tongi shows us a vast abstract landscape with a limited grayish color palette, a palette that only occasionally shows flashes and contrasting color accents. These alien landscapes are populated with various abstract shapes, sometimes angular and sharp reminiscent of shattered prisms, sometimes looking intriguingly organic. All this is reflected by the giant amoebas, the distant solitary cactus, the great smoking masses, and what appears to be a giant matchstick stem of a tarantula. All of these endowed with a shadow, with light projection, a feature that further accentuates the spatial emptiness that subjects these pseudo-characters. As Nathalia Brodsky has stated, this work could be one of the most impressive paintings by Tongi, at the same time that it could be labeled one of the most indebted to de Chirico's influence. We see falling shadows and the evocation of a sense of doom, the horizon, the emptiness of the plain. The magic lies in how the strange characters, with their shadows and their perspective, act as references to the real world, imbuing our heads with the reading of a work that moves away from abstraction, encountering the sensation of distant familiarity, of play with our spatial conception. How in the end, Tongi forces us to try to understand the intangible and the incomprehensible with his psychological poetry.
The Rapidity of Sleep. Artwork by Yves Tongi, from the year 1945. Compositionally, we see a deserted and unreal landscape framed by a space with an aerial and dispersed environment, dissected in turn by a high blurred horizon line. This last element focuses the gaze on the lower plane of the composition where the action takes place. On this occasion, the speed of sleep arranges all its pseudo-characters in the lower part, forming a kind of procession of figures directed towards a specific point, a stylized and whitish figure that immediately reminds us of a megalithic dolmen. On the left, there seem to be objects lying down, asleep, an analogy that connects with the notion of sleep, rest and stillness. After seeing the choice of the chromatic range, we see that the plain colors are harmonized to contribute to the atmospheric sadness that characterizes the author so much, since the reddish, muted and faint tones further enhance the contrast of the timeless and static movement of the objects. Represented Given that this work was made near the end of World War II, it would not be crazy to associate it with the sleep of victims on the battlefield, a theme that is not new at all in Tongi's artistic discourse. For its part, the small blue clearing that can be seen between the dense clouds could allude to that iota of hope, to the light after the journey. The Palace with Window Rocks Artwork by Yves Tongi, from the year 1942 this is a highly recognizable work by this singular artist, who began to paint without having a clue after seeing a painting by Giorgio de Chirico. We can indeed feel de Chirico in these strange and lonely forms of Tongi. We can also associate this painting with the vast landscapes of Dali's Kadaks or the dancing and organic forms of Miro. In short, Tongi was a self-taught surrealist who knew how to absorb the styles of his colleagues, achieving his own fascinating style. His vast and abstract landscapes tend to have a very limited palette and are inhabited by the most varied abstract forms, coming from the subconscious. They are probably a mixture of dreams, memories of his stay in Africa or his Breton homeland, and the artist's own imagination. Invented but strangely recognizable landscapes that the artist paints under overcast skies. It is very common for the upper part of his paintings to be pure sky and the lower part to have these architectures between the geological and the mechanical, between the organic and the inert, that cast long shadows projected backwards. Tongi painted this painting at his farm studio in Woodbury, Connecticut, the place where he fled the war with his American wife, and where they would live together for the rest of their days. Still and Always. Artwork by Yves Tongi, from the year 1942. It still and always became part of the Tyson Bornemissa collection in 1975. As in almost all of Tongi's fantastic landscapes, which invariably follow the same scheme, various unidentifiable and isolated forms appear in this one in the middle of a deserted landscape, with an endless horizon. In one of his writings from 1941, André Breton reflected on the importance of the horizon in Yves Tongi's painting. It is in their distant perspectives that Breton saw the representation of a distant and endearingly personal space, farther than horizon itself, a space reflected in an endless mirror. A quick and superficial reading can immerse us in a childish but secretly poisonous and infectious environment. The shapes are reminiscent of a playground surrounded by rot. Those lurid and radioactive greens, in contrast to the primaries of the figures, generate an unstable, insecure and dangerous sensation. An environment charged with toxicity, which could act as a timeless elegy, a speech for eternity that seems to vindicate childhood, that is how its title seems to anticipate it. That was all for today's video, tell us what you thought, and if you liked it, please give us your subscription and your like, this way you support the art community on YouTube. Until the next video, have a nice day.